All right, I uh, want to welcome everybody to another virtual meetup. A um, couple things as a reminder, uh, make sure you have your chat window open. Uh, any questions you have, uh, please type in there. We'll mute everybody and turn off your ability to unmute yourself until after the presentations are over. Um, one reminder, uh, we always get questions about how to, how to help support this event. The best way to support it is join the OPSIG, uh, opsig.org slash join. Uh, you can get digital copies for as low as 10 bucks a year. Um, we do four issues every, you know, once a quarter. Uh, so that's really the best way to support us. Um, the other thing we're looking for is we're looking for additional people to present. We have presenters through, I believe, the end of November right now. Um, you can do either a half, half session, which is about 20, 25 minutes, or if you've got enough material, you can have the whole, the whole time, the whole roughly an hour or so with some time for questions. So if you're interested in that, editor at opsig.org. Um, and always we're, we're always looking for articles for the next dispatcher's office. Uh, currently the January, 2021 issue is full. That's been sent off to the publisher uh, for layout. Um, so we're looking to populate the April, 2021 issue. Yes, it's <laughs> more than six months away, but that's how far out these, uh, these things work. So, uh, with that said, uh, we're going to start with Chuck Lagan from Hot Springs, Arkansas. Um, I'm going to spotlight him and mute everybody, and uh, we'll unmute you. Oop. All right, Chuck, you can go ahead and unmute yourself and uh, get started. Okay, uh, thanks, Eric. I think I am unmuted. Can uh, you hear me? Yep, yep, we Good. can hear you. Yeah. Go ahead, Chuck. Well, I appreciate uh, this, this opportunity to talk about an exciting subject called reciprocal switching. Um, I dealt with that a lot in my rare career, in my uh, time at the class one and the short line, actually. Uh, uh, in one, I was kind of defending uh, not using it. And in the other, the short line, I was in uh, defense of using it a whole lot because it meant additional business for us. But uh, as we all know about our railroads, uh, the, the main purpose of a railroad is to spot an empty car at some customer and uh, let them load it, pull it from their siding, and get it to destination. That's the main uh, purpose of uh, all our class one and two and three railroads all across the country. Uh, there is, however, a lot of other things going on behind the scenes that are revenue opportunities for uh, the, the railroads. Uh, there's basically five different types of switching. I'm gonna focus on reciprocal switching today in response to a question that came up from a prior uh, session. Uh, but the, the basic five types are you have intra plant switching. Uh, every customer is entitled to a spot at his siding to unload the car. But if he wants it moved to a different track or a different door spot, that's another revenue event for the, uh, the railroad. So that's intra plant switching, movement between spots or tracks within a plant. Hey, John. Intra terminal that's moving. Yes. Uh, real quick, did you want to put your Hello? slides up? Uh, I will put up slide, I'll start with slide number five a little later. Okay, whenever you're ready. I'm just, just gonna, wanna... Yeah, I'm just gonna talk through this, it'll, it'll go quick. That's fine, that's fine, go ahead. Uh, it, intra-terminal is a second type of switching. Uh, and that's where you're staying on one carrier within uh, defined limits uh, of a terminal or switching limits, defined switching limits. Uh, that's going maybe from one customer to another customer on that same carrier within that terminal. The third type is inter-terminal going between two carriers, two or more carriers, uh, within the defined limits of a switching, uh, a defined switching limits of, of a terminal. Uh, the fourth type is intermediate, where a car might come into town on one customer, uh, or on one carrier, and go to interchange to an intermediate carrier who does nothing but take that car to uh, a third carrier. He's performing an intermediate service <clears throat> and he's receiving revenue for that. All these uh, switching operations are at uh, revenue uh, for the carrier. The fifth type is reciprocal, and I've written that down here, so I'm gonna read what I got written down as to what the definition is. Reciprocal switching is the practice by which two or more railroads serving the same station open industries on their line to service by other carriers. The owning line receives a car on its interchange track from the other carrier, 
spots the car at the customer for loading, pulls the car from the customer, interchange it back to the other carrier. Now, all my rear career, uh, when I was on a class one, they wanted to handle that car from New York to California or, or New York to Chicago or Chicago to California. They wanted the long haul because that's where the revenue is. But carriers uh, occasionally want to get to uh, uh, other customers that aren't on their line and customers want to have access to other carriers. So this little dance goes on uh, between railroads and customers and this is called reciprocal switching. So how does this happen? Uh, reciprocal switching is an arrangement that requires an agreement between the carriers. Uh, it's normally negotiated by their uh, uh, marketing or commercial departments. Uh, the carrier identifies in its freight tariff, and you can still research this if you can get your hands on a freight tariff, what industries are open to switching, what industries are closed to switching. Uh, the car is switched for a fee. It's either absorbed in full or sometimes they'll set a, a, a switching limit. A carrier may say, well, I'll reciprocally switch a car for $400, but he doesn't really want to do that switch. So he says, but I'm only going to absorb uh, $100 of that. Uh, so he kind of restricts that uh, from going on. He, wants, he ultimately wants to handle that long distance move. He doesn't want to handle a short distance move. Uh, it's a very competitive situation between railroads. A lot of my, uh, and I'm going to show a little, I'm going to put up a slide here in a minute, uh, showing a little bit of the area that I dealt with for the last 21 years, of my railroad career here in Arkansas, and it was very competitive between UP and BNSF, which I don't know that uh, they really agree on what time of day it is, but uh, it was a very competitive situation for them. So why is reciprocal switching important? Uh, industries require, and I'll go as far as to say that some demand access to other carriers at the same location or terminal. It's not always granted. Uh, the bigger the carrier or the bigger the customer is, the more cloud he has. A uh, customer like General Motors may uh, lean on uh, a class one and say, you know, I, I want access to this other carrier at this location. And uh, they, they may get it, they may not get it. Uh, they may have to do a little horse trading with some business from a plant that that carrier doesn't serve. So it's, it's a little horse game, horse trading game that goes on here. Uh, usually there is something that the carrier receives, hence the term reciprocal. Uh, if you give me access to company A in your line, I'll give you access to company B uh, on my line. Uh, and many times carriers uh, are encouraging uh, a, another carrier. This is almost, this may sound a little odd, but there have been times where I've seen uh, one carrier talking to another carrier saying, hey, why don't you switch this plant? He's only got short haul business for me. Uh, he wants access to your line. Why don't you switch that? And maybe I don't really want to switch that plant. So then we say, well, what else is there in it for me? So it's, it's a game that goes on here. It is a way for railroads to get additional business. And this was important to uh, uh, my, uh, my career when I was on a short line, because to us, it was a switch charge. And it, it, uh, we didn't get much more than a switch charge on whatever uh, we got on all the rest of our business anyway. There is quite a dance that goes on between railroads. I'm going to uh, try a share screen here and let's see if I can get uh, something up here. Um, let's see. And somebody tell me if you can see that when you can see that. Yep, you're good. Sure. Can you see that? Yep. Good. Okay, sounds good. Uh, th this is a, a map of uh, North Little Rock, Little Rock, North Little Rock. That's the Arkansas River in the in the middle of the screen there. Uh, the industry, well, let me just orient you a little bit. The blue lines are Missouri Pacific coming through there, now uh, Union Pacific. Uh, that's uh, the one that comes in from the lower left and goes out to the upper right. That's the uh, Chicago to Houston main line. And this is their branch going up from Little Rock to Fort Smith. Uh, the, uh, and this was, um, uh, my, my short line company took over all the switching, everything south of Union Pacific down, down to the river. We took that over here in uh, 19, uh, uh, actually, uh, yeah, 1997 or 98. Uh, the Rock Island is on here kind of in a uh, uh, purple color and the red is the uh, cotton belt on here. And we, we, we took that all over. The industries that are noted one, two, three, and four in green, those are open to reciprocal switching. Five and six were not open to reciprocal switching. Uh, you might say, well, why, why is that? Uh, for whatever reason, and there was a whole host of reasons why 
these this little cluster of industries were open or were not open. Um, industries connected to the Cotton Belt, which became SP and then UP later, uh, that was uh, the so-called two to one conditions. Um, uh, the industry that was over here, number three, that was probably a, and I don't know this for a fact, but it, that was probably a negotiation between the two carriers at the time, because it was two tracks, there was another track coming in the north end of that industry. Uh, industry number four was tied to uh, the SP, uh, but they didn't want them going down here at the end of this line is an ash grove cement plant down here number six is that and they didn't uh, probably want them accessing uh, that plant here. So it, it's a it's an interesting situation uh, and I'm going to uh, in, in a little later slide here I'm going to show you a little bit of uh, I'm going to integrate this into our model railroads here a little bit as to how we how, how I kind of uh, play that out here a little bit. Uh, this is a snapshot of uh, one of the industries on my line, uh, that my model railroad that I'm building. Uh, uh, I call it the New York, Akron, and Western. It's fashioned after the old Erie from New York to Chicago. Hansman's Milling. Uh, Hansman's was an industry at Binghamton, New York on the DLNW. And if you notice, I happen to have, uh, this is actually a picture of what reciprocal switching looks like. Here's an Erie boxcar being spotted at Hansman's Mill in Binghamton on the Lackawanna. So here, the Erie Road freight train has set off interchange of cars at Binghamton. The Lackawanna engine has come over and picked up that car from interchange, spotting it at the, at the industry. When it's loaded, it'll go back out with the Lackawanna. They'll deliver it back to the Erie of Binghamton. So this is actually reciprocal switching in action. Um, some ways that switching can enhance model railroads, model railroad operations. And this actually goes hey, back Chuck? to uh Chuck? yep can you go to your next slide hello yeah my next slide yeah uh people are that saying the, the share is not moving all we're seeing is slide one just that one The sharing is paused on the top here. Okay, well, you need to, uh, uh, we're still seeing the Little Rock map. Okay. Um, it may be your bandwidth. Um, let me. You've got a copy of that. You want to pop it up there? Yeah, let me let me do that. Um, hold on just a sec. Can you hear me okay, Eric? Yeah, go ahead, Chuck. I just had to turn on the Okay, the audio. Go ahead. The audio is okay. Good. So uh, I, I kind of uh, uh, use some switching opportunities here. This goes beyond reciprocal switching, but uh, these are some of the things that we do on, on our railroad here. We take reefers uh, to and from icing racks. It's a switching event um, um, that can go to multiple places, multiple warehouses. Uh, if you have overloaded cars, this is actually an operational issue. If you have overloaded cars on your train, uh, you could uh, hand uh, a, a card to a crew and say you have an overloaded car there uh, on, on fly, put it in the first available side of your yard track, it's going to be reduced by a contractor. That would be that would make another switching event for that to be picked up by another train at a later time. Box cars to or from uh, clean out tracks, uh, there you have some switching opportunities. Flat cars to uh, team tracks uh, or circus ramps to unload, load or unload tractors, machinery, different types of things. Uh, tank cars or covered hoppers between storage tracks and yards and industries. Uh, in my short line uh, career, we were involved in the uh, large amount of storage, uh, making uh, storage yards down in uh, the Houston area. Tremendous storage opportunity down there. That's, uh, that's a tremendous uh, revenue uh, producer as well as uh, operational. Uh, cars between door spots or different tracks within that customer's plant. Uh, that's a very real thing that uh, uh, carriers are doing today and bad order cars in a train going to the nearest siding. That could be another opportunity for you to give a crew operating on your railroad uh, on the fly a car. Say you've got a bad order car on your train. Uh, it needs to go to the next siding that you're at here. Eric, if you could flip the slide here, please. Uh, on, my, on my railroad, I spice up operations uh, with what I call switching opportunity cards. Uh, things are going too smoothly. And that does happen occasionally, not too often. Uh, I walk around and arbitrarily hand out opportunity cards 
Uh, some prototypical examples are, uh, the first one is Best Foods warehouse manager just called. They are out of corn oil and facing a plant shutdown. Go to Best Foods and spot them a tank car as soon as possible. Uh, Best Foods happen to be, uh, in, in most of my industries are Erie industries that were on the Erie Railroad. Uh, Best Foods is a company that makes Hellman's, mayonnaise, Mazzola, corn oil, things like that. Uh, so this would be, uh, the crew would be out there on a branch somewhere. Uh, Best Foods is on my northern branch. Uh, the crew may have passed them already. They may have to go back to them, but it's a real life situation. Uh, this happens uh, on, on the real railroads and uh, this gives the crew a uh, kind of a uh, instant, uh, you, got, you got to attend to this situation, go back. Uh, the next one would be uh, the dock form and a warehouser reports uh, that the boxcar you just placed on their track is not lined up with the door and they cannot load it. Go back and respot it. Another real life situation that happens uh, quite often. Uh, if they don't have the opportunity to move it or don't want to move it, some uh, customers don't want to move a car once it's placed, uh, we give that uh, to the crew and they got to go back. Now, uh, on my northern branch is a single track railroad, so that means many times if I, and I don't normally give it to them before they get there, um, could have been from a prior crew, but I'm assuming it's their crew that misspotted it. Uh, they've got to figure out what to do with their train in a single track rear and then go back and respot the car. So again, using existing industries, existing cars, real life situations uh, to create some additional work opportunities. Uh, and the third one, uh, the, the card says uh, the passenger conductor on the commuter train reports their engine is dead. Find out their location, get your train off the main and take one engine to the passenger train immediately. The local freight agent will transport you back to your train. Uh, this is a, a really loaded situation. I don't give this to uh, a first timer visiting, running a train on my, on my railroad, but there's many things here. Uh, this card applies to, I've got three branch lines, different operations. Uh, this applies to any commuter train on any of the three branches, so it doesn't have to be specific to one. Uh, the conductor then has to find out where the train is. Uh, they got to get their train off the main, because again, single track line. Uh, and take one engine to the pasture train. Uh, most of my locals run with one engine. So he's pretty much got to put his uh, train on a siding and take his engine and go up there. If he has two engines, he can cut one off and take it up to the pasture train. Then all he needs is a ride back to his train. If he only has one engine, like most of them, uh, he then, when he helps the pasture train out, he's dead in the water. He's got to talk to the agent, dispatcher, train master, whomever, figure out where do I get my next engine from and uh, the freight agent will help them, uh, freight agent slash uh, yard master will help them uh, figure out where his next opportunity. He may have to go back to Croxton Yard where he started from and start the process all over. So it really gets a senior person thinking of all different things that are going on here. Eric, flip the page please. Uh, my last slide here. Uh, when I was putting some notes together on reciprocal switching, I stumbled upon this. Uh, the Association of American Railroads has an excellent 13-minute video on YouTube uh, with a simulation about reciprocal switching. It can be found at that address right there, and I think Eric is in the process of copying it. He's probably going to put that on the chat for you. Um, uh, it, it's a good little simulation uh, in, the, in the middle of that. If you notice, I'm at um, uh, minute 4.43. I'm just pointing it to you and I just realized you can't see my screen. So my point was useless, but I just pointed it out to you virtually. Uh, so in the middle of that, there is a, a nice little video it kind of takes it from the car coming in on carrier one, handing it off to carrier number two, going to the customer and back. And, and uh, I, I think it in, involves something like 64 moves or something like that to do that whole round trip cycle. So, um, that is the end of my presentation. I hope that answered uh, the question that came up a couple months ago on reciprocal switching. It's an interesting subject, and I trust you found it a little bit interesting. And maybe some new opportunities for uh, your, your model roads. All right, uh, there are some questions. Let me get my chat window back up here. Um, uh, to the people who are wondering, the second link uh, here will take you right to the point of the reciprocal switching. Um, and he, uh, uh, Rich Randall is asking you to, I think, repeat the definition of reciprocal switching slowly. 
Sure. And uh, Eric, are you putting up my full presentation for the guys to access also? You, you were going to do I'd that be happy to. Today. I'd be happy yeah. to. We'll uh, put it, that it up. is in there, but I will I will say it again. So, if, I mean, if you don't, if you're not able to catch it word by word, here's what it, here's what it is. I will go through it one more time quick. Reciprocal switching is the practice by which two or more railroads serving the same station open certain industries on their line to service by other carriers. The owning line, the line that owns the, uh, the access to that particular industry, the owning line receives the car on its interchange track from the other carrier, spots the car at the customer for loading or unloading, pulls the car from the customer and interchanges it back to the other carrier. So the, the, the carrier that is actually performing the switching service, the reciprocal switching service, he is not actually uh, getting the road haul. He, he might be deprived of thousands of dollars of revenue, but he's going to get a reciprocal switch charge of a couple hundred dollars. That's why large carriers don't generally like reciprocal switching if they can avoid it. All right. Um, hopefully, Rich, that, that that's helpful. We will put the full, he has a full presentation that we'll put up on the OPSIG site um, after the present, after the, after the day or after our event's over. Um, next question, who owns the track located at the customer's industry, the railroad or the customer? I think generally that's the, the customer, right? <laughs> uh, well, yeah, generally the switch is owned by the railroad and from the clearance point beyond the switch is owned by the industry. That's generally okay. what I found in my career. All right. Um, let's see. Uh, from my, from my traffic manager experience is the originating or delivering received a larger split of the freight charges. How does that work in reciprocal switching? Uh, the, the division of revenue really is uh, totally separate from uh, reciprocal switching. Reciprocal switching is just who has access uh, to that customer on my line. If I have a Nabisco bakery on my line and uh, there's another carrier in town and Nabisco wants access to the other, it's up to me as the railroad to decide, yes, I want it open or no, I don't want to open it to the other carrier, but it's a reciprocal arrangement. But that uh, He was talking about the division of revenue on the road hall, that this is really totally separate. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, uh, what is a typical switching charge for reciprocal switching? Uh, I've seen it in my career as low as $10 a car, uh, and it's normally now up around 400 ish thereabouts, 300, 400, whatever. It does vary greatly. Um, Conrail really changed that dynamic in my career there. They were, they, somebody woke up in the marketing department at my, during my time there and said, you know, we are the gross seller of switching. We're selling a lot more switching than we're than we're buying, so why not make some money on it? And they did. They, the charge went up like from 125 bucks to 350, 400 dollars a car. Yeah. Um, okay. So let's see. Alan uh, Alan Lease Lisey asked: Some industries have had have had arrangements for one railroad to switch an industry for a certain period of time, then it would switch it for the next equal period of time. Is this considered part of reciprocal switching. So this year we do it, next year you do it. Yeah, that, no, that's just a, a joint switching arrangement. Uh, that's, that's common across the U.S., but that's not reciprocal switching. Okay, that's just, uh, all right. Um, let's see, uh, talk about two different railroads switching the same industry. So, yeah, uh, I, I think what he may be asking about is uh, that under reciprocal switching, the railroad who owns the switch going into the industry, he's the one that actually does the switching. Um, there are cases, uh, Eric, and just what you were talking about, the uh, switching arrangement it could be, uh, I've seen plants that are switched in the morning by one carrier in the evening by another. Usually it's different tracks within that plant. But uh, usually, most industries are switched by one carrier. Okay. Um, Tim is asking: Do reciprocal switching arrangements continue past mergers? They do. Yeah, they are. You're generally transferring a property, and whatever uh, arrangements are there. If you want to change something, that's a matter of negotiation. Right. Uh, 
right. usually they're grandfathered in. Right. They have to they have to honor all their contracts and everything just because they're right. changing letters. Right. Now. Yeah, not not to say it won't change down the road, but uh, that's hard to overturn. All right. Um, centered on the. Okay, in the case of the car that did not line up centered on the industry door, who pays, the customer or the railroad? The railroad. Seems like the railroad, it's their error. Their so. error. Okay. Yeah. All right, um, I think that's all the questions. So um, what I'll do, I'll put up your, the, the full presentation you sent me along with a link to that, uh, that YouTube video, jumping right That'd to the great. section about reciprocal switching that will be up on the uh the opsig website under the virtual section in the past meetings uh, area so um chuck thanks so much for presenting um we all appreciate it it's good information thank you all right you. and next up we have uh sean or uh, seth newman from out in the bay area somewhere undisclosed location um I'm gonna spotlight you here. Oops, hold on. All right. All right, Seth, you can go ahead and unmute yourself and take it away. Well, thank you. And uh it's a secure undisclosed Mountain View, California. Um and let me see if we can find our page here and come on. There we are. All right. So uh, I modeled the uh, Union Pacific Oakland sub uh, used to be the Western Pacific first sub and a little bit of the former Western Pacific San Jose branch, which became the Milpitas sub when UP took over. But actually, six months after the date I model, and that's what kind of set the latter cap, uh, it was sold to the uh, uh, Valley Transit Authority to become the uh, just finally 20 years later opened BART branch to uh, San Jose. So that's really what we're talking about. Uh, Harry's picture here is showing uh, a tourist line, which is a former Southern Pacific uh, line. Uh, through the canyon uh, or through Niles Canyon that parallels the Oakland sub. And that's also modeled. And uh, they have this uh, passenger uh, torpedo boat Jeep. Uh, and uh, Atherin was kind enough to make a model of that a few years ago. So we'll talk about that a little bit as we go forward. Uh, little tour for those of you uh, somewhat familiar with the Bay Area. We're looking at the Southern end of the Bay. And uh, if you can follow my mouse cursor, here's San Jose, here's Mountain View. And the line I model runs from a place called Radom, which is kind of the east end of Pleasanton, uh, down through Niles Canyon. And then it follows the uh, uh, former uh, coastline down to uh, uh, San Jose. And uh, for our purposes, it ends in Newell Yard in, in San Jose. It's about 22 real miles of railroad. Uh, I discovered Niles Canyon in 1970 when I had first come up uh, to the Bay Area as a student. And I was intrigued because there were two railroads within 100 yards of each other following uh, uh, Alameda Creek. Uh, for about 20 miles and it had lots of interesting bridges and, uh, you know, mainline action on the uh, Western Pacific side, which was at the time the UP's access to the Bay Area. This is prior, obviously, to the SP merger, which occurred in, uh, uh, well, when Union Pacific took over Western Pacific in 81 and then the merger in 96. So uh, the SP line had become uh, the Niles Canyon Railroad, which is a tourist line, and that was interesting because they had uh, interesting equipment, and it was close to home and easy to research. Uh, so I'll, I'll try and keep the layout designy stuff to a minimum because this is really an ops presentation. But uh, 
uh, after a series of assignments, my wife and I returned to the Bay Area. We had kept our house and just rented it out. Uh, and uh, there was a question about buying a new house and uh, getting some nice upgrades or uh, upgrading the existing house. And, you know, my feeling was, sure, you can have that nice master bedroom suite, but a man has to have a mainline run. And uh, so that resulted in a, a purpose-built room being added on to the front of one of the bedrooms and then a new office uh, for me, built off the side of that, which kind of replaced the bedroom we lost. Um, so that was great. We were working at the time, had lots of money to fund all this, but uh, we didn't have a lot of time. Um, and I'm operations oriented and I wanted to get running quickly. So uh, my friend Byron Henderson, uh, who many of you know as the layout design journal editor, uh, you know, and I had some interesting discussions around the 2000 NMRA convention in San Jose, and we ended up with a single deck, simplified construction, limited number of scenes centered on a few large industries, which would allow us to get going quickly and actually provided a better operational focus. Um, so here's the layout schematic. The visible layout is the strong black line at the bottom, where you see us coming down the uh, Oakland sub from Radom to Niles Junction. And then we continue down from Niles Junction to uh, Milpitas where the main yard is. And the reason for Milpitas was it supported in the day two auto plants, the uh, Ford plant, uh, which is now a big tourist mall and the uh, Numi plant, which was the former GM plant. And we'll talk about that a little more. Uh, there's a crossover to some hidden track, which represents uh, in one direction, the Nile sub and in the other direction, in the Milpitas sub. Um, and what you've really got is a point to loop where you come out of staging here, if you can see that. And then you can proceed uh, up the Nile sub and typically cross over at Niles, or you can come up or come down the Oakland sub and continue down to uh, Milpitas and then uh, return through the hidden trackage. Uh, so the uh, mnemonic here is the Niles sub goes to Oakland and the Oakland sub goes to Niles and we're not making this up. Um, here's a uh, track plan and we'll keep referring to these two diagrams just to keep it obvious. Uh, but the room's about 34 feet long and 14 feet wide, except at the point where we're still using the original fourth bedroom in the house. And that's 12 and it flares out. But as you can see, I had to keep the yard aisle uh, available for a door. So we have direct access to the patio, which is great for ops and uh, uh, for open houses. And then we have access to the office, which serves as the office during the session. And we'll talk about that. Okay, so here's the operations part. Uh, operations, of course, is modeling the jobs of the railroad. And uh, I had happily become acquainted with operations before I got too far into the design process. And there were some jobs I really wanted to model. So we have local crews. And the key ones are the 54 local, which will kind of build this presentation around. The NUMI job, which is a very heavy switching job and just supports the plant. And I'm planning to do another clinic about that. So, you know, if we continue to hold these for some time, you'll see that. There's a BNSF trackage rights local, which has access to some of the industries. And uh, we'll have to talk to Chuck about that because I don't think they were reciprocal. I think these were just granted as conditions of the SPUP merger. And then we have the Mission Bay local, which uh, does a lot of work in the yard area because there is no yard switcher. Um, we have a dispatcher. Uh, the, the, the prototype was TCS uh, as far as the yard limits in Milpitas, uh, TCS being the US and S trade name for what we think of as CTC. And originally I wanted to have a yard master because those of you who've operated with me know I like yards when I'm not dispatching, but I found out that Milpitas didn't have a yard master because it didn't have a dedicated switch job. So it has a clerk. 
as a result, most of the switching work has been given to the local jobs and even the transfers. And that actually had the very desirable benefit of uh, really enriching those jobs and giving them more to do. And then there's a couple of transfers through trains and an ACE commuter train. And if there's nobody else to run those, I'll usually run them myself, assuming the session's going pretty well. Um, so let's follow the 54. It starts in Milpitas as a turn, working only trailing point switches. It works its way railroad north, and it, it pains me to say that as a Westerner, because we all know railroads run from east to west. But uh, uh, there you have it in the timetable. It's a north-south railroad. And uh, it work, works all the way north to Radom, and then he turns on the Y and returns, again, working the trailing point. So the 54 is a popular job because it works the entire visible layout. Um, crews work from switch lists. Uh, the wheel reports, which you see here, are generated by an RFID system. You drag the train over the reader, and it will print out this uh, switch list in order. And uh, we certainly could automate that, but the regular clerks really prefer to write it themselves. So, uh, you know, they'll fill in the from and to and give the list to the to the crews. So generally, the clerk and the crews are communicating via switch list. The clerk tells them what to put where, and the crews bring them back and tell us about any off spots. Um, so we start at Milpitas, which is down at the bottom, and this is the main yard. Again, it was it was uh, originally WP's yard for supporting the Ford plant. And uh, it fulfills some of the functions of both Milpitas and Warm Springs yards at, at the current time. The physical layout of the model is a little closer to the old WP. Uh, and that was just a question of getting all the switching activity we wanted in. Um, so here's an aerial photo, and there's a series of aerials. A friend of mine's a private pilot and uh, belongs to a club and was kind enough to fly me over the, uh, over the route a few times in the days before we had uh, Google Earth. Uh, that's much easier. Now you can do it any time. Um, so the through trains arrive here and essentially they swap blocks with the yard. Uh, southbound trains uh, continue down the branch and then get on the main. Uh, UP does this in the real world periodically, but the city of San Jose doesn't like the noise. So this is always contentious. Uh, but uh, there, that, that actually is prototypical, at least some of the time. Um, northbound or eastbound trains leave via Roseville, and they go back up the Oakland sub. And we presume they get to Roseville, and at that point, proceed over the Overland route to North Platte, or uh, uh, up uh, over the Cascades, uh, over the Shasta route to uh, Klamath Falls, and then to Portland. Um, here's a quick picture of Milpitas Yard. We don't do much with the 54. We'll generally find our cars waiting for us here on the AD passing track and maybe a few scattered around. And they'll have a switch list that tells them uh, what to get where. And then we ask them to block it. Now, I realize blocking in the yard is not all that common in the prototype, but uh, there's really no yard or empty track you know, 10 miles down the road to go uh, sort the train out on my layout. So we have them do it in the yard. And that actually has the benefit that it keeps them busy for about a half an hour. So the uh, morning commuter train can run across the railroad and get safely in the clear before they start to work. Um, so uh, anyway, the session starts, it's 8 a.m. Uh, they fueled up, you can see the uh, uh, tank truck waiting for them. And the clerk is uh, motoring over to hand up the paperwork to the uh, uh, crew. And they're waiting here on a, on engine track. And we do give them a caboose because we assume they shove a lot. Um, I think it was really gone in those days, but I had a very cool CA-11 caboose uh, that I really wanted to use in operations. Um, once they assemble, they head north and go around the peninsula, and they're going to pass Snowboy. Now, they're not going to work Snowboy. That's actually handled by one of the poles on the NUMI job, and uh, BNSF has 
trackage rights uh, to handle Snowboy, which is a large bulk transfer facility. And once again, we're not making this up. That's really the way it works. Um, here's a picture of Snowboy. You can see it's nine tracks. They're about eight cars long. Um, and trucks are pulling up. There's power, uh, lighting, and so forth. And uh, Snowboy gets its name because it used to be a packing house. And you can see the snowboy there with his uh, sun-kissed oranges. Remember, this used to be called the Valley of Heart's Delight before it became Silicon Valley. And it's very rich orchard land, uh, in a way, a little bit of a waste to have it uh, full of software companies. Um, but we have snowboy also. Hey, 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 hey. Let's not what? bash on the software companies here. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> I made a lot of money working for them. You oh, know. I... <laughs> <Go on. laughs> Go ahead, Seth. <laughs> um, yeah, absolutely. Um, that's a whole other discussion that I'd be happy to have sometime. So here's Snowboy, uh, and you can see uh, pretty much the same, except that for operational reasons, uh, actually what happened here was uh, because it was at the end of the peninsula, I wanted a view block. So we put a little pellet transfer facility in, and that kind of made it logically more sense to put the uh, hoppers. And, and most of the traffic there is pellet hoppers supporting uh, industries that either support the auto plant or the plant themselves for things like door panels, dashboards, and so forth. Uh, and you can see there's a little um, uh, series of underground uh, pipes and uh, now uh, they're sort of obscured by the cars there that they would hook up to and somebody's doing some work on that. Um, so normally, uh, if you look back at the, uh, the other picture there, you can see that uh, the uh, pellet hoppers are over on this side. So we kind of flip that for operational reasons. And these have particular functions. There's general tanks, there's an acid track, there's a chlorine track, and this is off spots. But uh, again, this is uh, just more for your information because we're not actually working that. Uh, then we're going to continue past NUMI. Uh, and you can see we have very typical auto plant arrangement with a crossover and uh, long cars at one end, in this case, body parts and uh, racks, and then a series of uh, drivetrain steel and general parts on the other side. Uh, and that's all protected by blue flags. And, uh, you know, basically you only get access to the tracks you need because we're assuming that the plant being a Toyota plant, NUMI being a GM Toyota joint venture, operates on a just-in-time basis. And uh, they're just getting what they need to keep the shift going. Um, and here's a quick overview. In 99, they were mostly building Toyota Tacomas. 99, if you remember, was the height of the internet boom and they were just making trucks as fast as they could. They made a few Corollas for Toyota and uh, some Geo Prisms, which were basically Chevy Corollas. Um, here's a picture uh, of the steel track. Uh, it, the plant was actually not getting steel by rail that late, but uh, gives you an idea of how the operating scheme works. Uh, there's a number of industries that are on life support here in the real world. They'd gone away in the previous decade or two, but they're still working to give us a little more work. Um, here's the parts end. Uh, interesting enough, the containers were trucked down from Oakland. There were several proposals over the years to have a lift in the plant. And then even after the plant shut down, uh, as, uh, which, which occurred briefly in 2008 uh, when GM went bankrupt, uh, Toyota didn't want to take it over because that would have meant they would have ended up with GM's union and they wanted no part of that. So uh, UP had the land and wanted to set up a lift, but the city decided they would much rather have light industry or uh, more software companies. So eventually the plant was taken over by uh, Tesla and is now uh, making Tesla Model 3s as fast as they can. Um, 
and here's the uh, east end. And by the way, these are uh, essentially click charts that are at each work location. So this is available for the crews. I also send this out as a PDF before in case anybody's having insomnia. Um, I want them well rested when they get to my layout. And here's the rack loaders at Numi. Um, I point this out mostly because the train cat loaders are absolutely phenomenal and impossible to build. So somehow Steve William pulled this off and a big shout out for it. Um, okay, finally, we're going to get to work. We've come around the corner and we've gotten to basically Niles Junction where the uh, Oakland sub comes in and we have a cluster of industries. Um, We've got Lehigh Cement, which is a great big uh, bulk transfer facility. It's actually a few miles north. You can see it from 880 if you're familiar with the East Bay. Uh, here's a aerial view. You can see the uh, loading shed. You can see the bag warehouse. You can see the main silo. Um, and uh, it's got internally a track mobile. And here's 54 coming around to work on it. And uh, Let's see, somebody has just pulled into the silo right ahead of the train so he can get his uh, cement. Um, and uh, master builder Earl Gerbavon, who's kind of the structure guru for my work night crew, uh, did this building. It, um, I think it got 113 points, something like that. Um, here's a little closer work you can see some of the fencing and gates and sheds. And at this point, uh, the 54 is spotting uh, a reefer at the team track uh, behind, uh, or I guess in front of uh, the uh, Lehigh cement plant. And uh, looks like the consignee was pretty uh, hot to get the cold product because his reefer van is waiting for it. And Here's a view of Niles and you can see there's uh, two tracks and typically the plant switcher will sort out the uh, cars going back on the UP from the cars that are going to be picked up by the uh, BNSF trackage rights train later in the in the session. And then the team track is um, over on the side by the aisle. Um, so once they've gotten that together, they're going to go up the canyon. And uh, as you can see, we've continued around into the scenic area, which is uh, kind of the eye candy on the layout. And uh, what they're going to do is uh, continue up through the tunnel. And this is tunnel one on the Western Pacific. And interestingly, until the SP merger, this was the longest tunnel on the Union Pacific. And you can see next to it the ruins of the Pacific Brick Company or Pabrico. Uh, uh, brickyard. And, you know, Eric mentioned secure undisclosed locations. I first started do, doing this clinic during the second Gulf War, I think. And, uh, you know, it kind of looked like the senior Iraqi leadership had been hiding out here. Um, but this side was actually served by the SP. But again, for uh, play value, we've we've moved it over. Um, we, we had some insight into how it was switched because a gentleman who was at the time president of the PCR who's since passed worked there as a summer job when he was in college. So um, here you can see uh, Pabrico. I've just modeled it as uh, uh, a smokestack and a couple of kilns and a loading dock. And uh, 54 is uh, heading up the canyon. The switch to the left is the former SP or the Niles Canyon Railway, which as I say, we also model a little bit of. Uh, let's see here. And uh, then we have really the scenic highlight. It has nothing to do with the 54, but I just pointed out here because it's, it's cool. This is the uh, Farwell Bridge. It's a pin connected truss bridge, which is very close to the prototype of the uh, uh, Central Valley uh, pin connected truss bridge. And my friend, David Parks, uh, kit bashed it into a skew. You can see the prototype has the little deck girder bridge and it has the skewed pin connected truss bridge. And there was also a little pony truss, which we didn't have room for. And uh, also behind here, there's a Cal Fire station, 
which is, I think, kind of a cool thing in the canyon. But in the end, there was no place to put it. So uh, uh, happily, uh, Scene Master or whoever owned them at the time was kind enough to release a fire truck in Cal Fire color. So uh, we've suggested that by prominently displaying a fire truck. Um, so OK, we continue through the canyon and get to some place where we actually uh, might do some work. And that is Hearst, although we're actually going to get it on the way back because it's facing point now. But for Bay Area people, it's right off the uh, uh, 680, uh, just south of uh, Sonol Pleasanton Road exit. And you can see the freeway, and you can see the siding. And over here, you can see the Niles Canyon Railway, and there's Pleasanton Sonol Road. So there's a lot happening there. And um, you can see we're having a meet with the uh, Altamont Computer Com Commuter Express uh, passenger train. And uh, here we are in the hole for the, for the ACE. Actually, in reality, the ACE goes in the hole because it's short and can accelerate quickly. And it's usually only meeting a rock train, but the rock train is, you know, as you might imagine, heavy. So they try to keep him moving on the main. Over on the side here is a maintenance of way siding, which a little after my time period got a, uh, uh, an interchange with the Niles Canyon Railway, the tourist operation, so they can get their historic equipment. And I actually modeled that because in uh, 2003, when that was done, I was still working on the area. So there's a little anachronism in here, but uh, adds to the play value. Um, so as I say, here comes the ACE, and here's the bridge um, back here. You can see the bridge at Verona Road, and uh, whoops, wrong way. And that's modeled fairly accurately, and uh, we'll have another picture of it later. And at that point, we come into Pleasanton. So there's a couple of industries that are interesting in Pleasanton, and there's also a restored type 22 depot, which is interesting historically, although it's since been moved and become a sushi joint and a mortgage company. Um, so we're modeling it that way. But we do have, um, and here we are over on this short peninsula. Uh, here's the depot. We, David, actually built this wonderful accurate model of it, but it was just too big. So we're in the process of rebuilding a, a smaller one with uh, lit interior and some nice animation bells and whistles. Um, so here's actually what it looks like. And this whole scene is about eight feet long. Uh, we built a modern commuter station. This is the location of the depot and there's also a lumber yard and behind it, there is a winery. Uh, which we are assuming is rail served by uh, RBLs, you know, beer cars. Um, now there's a little interesting story around the winery. There were rumors that it was mafia owned, although unfortunately the historical society says, no, it was just a really ugly family feud. And one of our modeling friends, you guys may know Jim Providenza was on the police force in Livermore the next town over and said, no, he'd never heard it had anything to do with organized crime and all the time he was out there. So it was sad, but it's still an excuse to route the occasional cement hopper too, because they clearly need some uh, footwear. Um, here's Villa Armando. You can see it has this uh, kind of patched together warehouse with a loading dock right off the main. And here's Villa Armando has kind of a patched together warehouse with a loading dock right off the main. We're in the process of adding another building. This is laser bashed. Uh, I drew us all up in Inkscape and uh, uh, one of the guys had access to a laser printer. So it's actually sitting in a box waiting to be completed. Uh, one of the things I didn't get to during the pandemic. Um, so he reaches in or 54 reaches in and, and switches it here. And you can see we have uh, some uh, RBLs. Um, I have since discovered on the SP list that the evergreen paint was gone by uh, 99. So um, have to trade that one away and use something more period appropriate. It's too bad. Nice car. Uh, 
interesting door and a half box um, anyway. Uh, at the end of the line, we get to Radom, which is East Pleasantum. It's not Radium, it's Radum. I'm not quite sure where that name comes from. Um, but uh, while it was in use, it was the end of the San Ramon branch on the SP. So the SP took off and then the WP crossed it. So there were actually two crossings. Uh, and we use that Y as the entrance to staging and a place to turn trains. Eric, how am I doing on time here? Do I have another 15? Hello? Um, I mean, we're at five o'clock right now, but we kind of warned people up front that this was going to go. We've still got 100 people, so I'd say cool. keep going. All right, I'll just keep going fast. Sorry about that. Yep. No, that's fine. Um, so again, here's the map. You can see the Y. This is staging over here. Uh, and we'll come around the back. And the Kaiser Sand and Gravel Crit uh, pits as Kaiser also ceased operation kind of summer of 99. So that's a reason we model spring. It's uh, switched by a critter. Um, one, of, one of these days I'm going to uh, 3D print a proper shell for the Plymouth CR8. Uh, there were only eight of them ever made and they were all a little different. So I think my chances of ever getting a commercial model are slim and none, but happily it has the same wheelbase and the same truck wheelbase as a Bachmann 44 tonner. So we're using one as a stand-in and eventually a chassis. Um, so here's what the 54 really looks like. This is up at Rhodes Jamison, which is the next gravel pit down the line, a little bit to the east, just off the layout. And uh, it's still in operation today. And you can see it's got a X Rio Grand GP40 and a UP GP38. And here she is uh, on the layout. Hmm. Uh, in front of Kaiser Sand and Gravel. This is another Earl Gerba von job. Uh, at least the main structure is. Um, and uh, great stories to go with that, but we're really talking more about operations. So they come around and they'll go back up to Pleasanton and reach in um, and uh, exchange uh, empties for loads uh, and then continue along their way. Um, here's another aerial of the, uh, of the area. And what you can see is the breaker, the conveyors you just saw, let's, uh, there you go. And uh, of course it reaches way, way back um, past the front of the street out into Katrina way and into my neighbor's front yard. And if I were to model it in scale, but you get the general view and here's the main line running around the front. Um, so after he's switched, he comes along and uh, He's going to go back. Well, actually, he's probably pulling up here and he's about to go uh, back down into the uh, Pleasanton area with the hoppers. And uh, you can see he's back at Verona Road. Um, we showed you that prototype photo a little earlier. Probably should move it in the presentation. By the way, Pat Latores, who will show up later, used to be a competitive cyclist. And uh, this scene is inspired by Pat's, uh, inspired by a true story that uh, is told by Pat Latores of the bicyclists and the trucker riding right up their tail, was, honking furiously. Was Pat in the uh, San Leandro Club? Yes, he is. He still I, is. I knew him when I lived out there in the mid 90s. So it's kind of funny to hear his name. Same old Pat, and we'll, we'll see his, uh, uh, his mug, a little aged, but still there. Uh, and Pat, when he lived on the peninsula, actually was a, a regular, uh, you know, Monday night guy and is still one of my regular operators, uh, one of the rotating core of regular clerks. Um, staging is in the back. Uh, you, you saw the hook there past the Y. And what we've got is some staging down the wall where I'm waving the cursor and a drop down. And that's just done with a, a couple of carriage bolts that we uh, uh, screw in when we need them. And then you can see below there is the workbench and uh, the global research and development campus of model railroad control systems. Um, and uh, see a few trains here, but these these tracks, when you get done with them, are about 16 feet long each, and we shotgun them. There's typically two eight foot trains in each one. 
Um, here's a view with the drop down dropped in and uh, you know there's a rack train. This is probably a uh, BNSF local given the power um, and uh, manifest Oakland uh, Rose, uh, Roseville San Jose manifest or MRVSJ and these are all real trains that actually run on the on the prototype railroader did in 99. Um, you know, from a workstation perspective, now this is back in Milpitas Yard, which is mostly handled by the Mission Bay local. Uh, everything's kind of Velcroed together. We have those uh, schematics that you saw. These are just laminated with a piece of Velcro. You can, you know, take them off and put them out of the way or tack them up somewhere where you need to see them. Uh, the uh, cabs all have Velcro on the back. The small clipboards with switch lists have them on the back. And then over here, you can see the click list. Um, I try to provide a place for uh, liquids. Um, you can pretty much bring anything you want in there. I kind of prefer less sticky liquids, but as long as it's below track uh, you know, level, be comfortable. Um, I provide... Uh, holders for picks so you don't have to have the sharp needles uh, in your pocket, you know, don't want you to impale your stuff. Um, behind here is a paper box warehouse, which is uh, generally switched by Mission Bay, uh, several other industries. I say that that's probably the subject of another uh, clinic. And let's talk a little more about ops since this is the OPSIG. Um, the industry jobs are NUMI, all session long, five pulls. They'll pull, they'll work the parts uh, spurs at NUMI, then go back and do the racks, then go back and take one pass at Snowboy. At that point, we usually swap because this is usually after uh, a lunch break if it's an all day session or kind of the end of the session if it's an evening session. Um, and then another crew will come on and, you know, do another uh, parts and, uh, uh, auto parts uh, and, and auto racks uh, cycle. Uh, Mission Bay Local also includes the critter, which is an industry job. So they'll come in, do a little bit of work in their yard, and then get out of 54's way so he can build his train and go off and work that. Uh, you saw the track mobile. We talked about the, uh, uh, 50, the 44 tonner at, uh, uh, come on, Kaiser. And they'll also run the Niles Canyon Railway, go out and drop off or pick up a piece of historic equipment. So those guys, that's the that's a very heavy switching job. The locals are the 54. We just kind of walked you through that. And his afternoon counterpart usually starts about an hour into the afternoon session and may or may not get done. They'll come down, work some of the industries in the opposite direction. They do a big interchange at the yard. Uh, they'll do some work at Snowboy. And uh, they have lots of fun because typically everything they need to get at has just been covered by the third uh, NUMI pole. So they have some fun, uh, almost Jim Sinise like sabotaging one another. And uh, then uh, they'll work a few more industries and head back to, to Stockton. Uh, then we have a series of through trains and those are handled by either somebody on one of the other crews who isn't particularly busy at the moment, or I'll take care of it. If somebody's hanging around, they can do it. And we have the ACE and then we have a few overhead trains, but usually everybody's having too much fun switching to want to run an overhead train, even if it's cool. Um, here's your typical call board. Um, gives you an idea. We try to get everybody started early. The Mission Bay local is waiting at the beginning of the session. So is the ACE. NUMI is working in the yard. Uh, or actually, NUMI will have pulled into the NUMI plant. So they don't take it out of the yard. It's actually already in the yard. So they can get to work without fouling the lead, which 54 needs to work. And here's 54. He's got his engine on the engine track, as you saw in the early photo. And uh, then we have a, you know, a, an Oakland to West Colton manifest, which is going to do a block swap. Uh, uh, an autos, Oakland to... Uh, uh, Spring, Texas, which will come down from uh, over the Oakland sub and then just disappear south uh, with uh, a rock with racks after the uh, NUMI job is done. Uh, uh, the first rack pull. 
Uh, then we'll have the Roseville San Jose Manifest. That comes in with a bunch more uh, cars for the auto plant and cars for tomorrow's 54 and a few for the Mission Bay local to take away to serve customers on the San Francisco Peninsula. Then BNSF local will come in, do a block swap. Generally, the swap is paper cars for Smurfit. Uh, because we assume that he's got the cars from uh, Smurfit's uh, box plant in Missoula. And uh, he will also have some cars for the auto plant, which he doesn't actually switch himself. And then we may run a second auto. Uh, I'm, no, I'm sorry, a second uh, manifest. This is a manifest Oakland to city of industry. It's basically a repeat of the West Colton uh, train uh, City of Industry is a smaller yard, a little closer to downtown LA, but they do get some direct traffic. Uh, and then the ACE runs back the other way and we have a clerk and a dispatcher. So I typically run an eight person crew plus myself and a helper. Uh, and, uh, you know, we try to keep everybody busy. Um, switching and car forwarding. Okay, so that's done in the office right where I'm sitting as I speak. Uh, we run under CATS and I saw Rodney and a whole bunch of the CATS list regulars on the list. Um, so CATS is a simulation of uh, Digicon. Uh, this section of railroad sadly was never uh, dispatched via Digicon. They used CAD, but uh, as I mentioned on the CATS call the other day, uh, Breezy Gust, who was uh, DS-57, this is actually dispatched by DS-58 and was very familiar with the area, uh, as, as a UP uh, train dispatcher, uh, uh, had me and Steve Williams, who worked with me on this project, uh, come up and he sat us down in the big chair on Uncle Pete's Railroad and explained to us why you never, ever, 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 ever want to model CAD for model railroaders. And we came away pretty well convinced. Can you say TN 3270, all of those of you who are old uh, data processing guys? Um, not fun, whereas uh, CATS is a uh, point and click and uh, generally uh, as close to uh, uh, boomer dispatcher nirvana as you're going to get to. Um, um, and here's Pat Latore's uh, in front of the pickle rack, which is perpetual inventory car locator. And Pat is the only one on the layout or Larry or Earl, whoever's doing it that week, uh, who actually touches cards. And you can see he's looking at the cards, looking at the rack, looking at his charts and filling out switch lists. And that's what he does. So he has to play kind of a head game, a couple of moves ahead and figure out where there's room. Uh, because the last thing he wants is crews coming through the door and telling him they can't spot the car. Um, and um, here's another picture of a switch list. Uh, yeah, we basically talk through this. Um, okay, so uh, I'm a product manager from telecom, so you're not going to get out of here without the speeds and feeds chart. Um, we use NCE wireless. I have four dog bones. Most of them are actually radio equipped power cabs, three knobbies, two five amp boosters, TTX power shields and TTX AR auto reversers. Uh, we have Y throttle server for those who want to uh, use Y throttle. And I guess as we come back to real operations, a lot of people would probably prefer to handle their own throttle. So we'll see a little more use. I do have a very nice hard throttle, which is a very nice UT4 equivalent. So even though I'm an NCE guy, uh, uh, the UT4 has its charms and this has most of those uh, uh, values. Um, I use CMRI for the CTS, uh, CTC, and for signaling. Uh, detection is a mix of uh, the classic DCCODs, which are wonderful, and my model railroad control system, CPODMs, which are uh, drop-in replacement. A uh, mix of S-mini nodes, which work just great, no need to rip them out if they're working, and uh, our CP nodes, which are Arduino-based equivalents. They're on the same CMRI line, mix and match, everything works great. One of these was just a very small one where it wouldn't have been economical to use a, a S-mini. The other was, frankly, a science project just to ensure that they really were compatible. Turnouts and controls. 
a mix of hand built, uh, mostly because of geometry, um, Pico Code 83, and Fast Tracks. Uh, you know, we started out hand building, it was just going slowly. Then Pico came out with the Code 83, which are wonderful if a little spendy. And then the Fast Tracks, which are, they don't look quite as good as the Pico or the latest ME. Uh, but they are the smoothest thing going. If I were to redo it, I would just get myself a number six, and number eight fast track jig and be done with it. Um, and I would use their point frames for the, you know, filing jigs for the few odd ones. Uh, turnout motors, um, anything controlled or locked by the dispatcher has a motor as well as a couple that are too far from the aisle to be uh, controlled by hand. Everything else is just uh, a slide switch with a linkage. Um, uh, most of the switch motors are still tortoises. They work fine. They were mostly in before I started handling the uh, MTB MP series motors, uh, although there's a couple that I put in since. Um, they all work fine. I generally don't replace things that are already working just because I came out with a new product. Um, Code 83 rail on the main, uh, 70 and a little bit of Code 75 Pico on the industries. Um, the Code 75 Pico is kind of European looking. So it's mostly in places where we've got uh, pavement down, which is generally drywall mud. Uh, let's see, lessons learned, um, getting pretty close to the end. So hang on a few more. I originally built this, I said, simplified construction with double slat, uh, uh, double slot uh, shelf brackets and 24 inch doors. Uh, do not, do not, do not go wider than 24 inches. The stuff uh, tends to twist. I had to stiffen them with pieces of angle, giant pain in the neck. Um, so the benefit of that was it's light and easy for one person to move it. But frankly, the bench work phase is very quick and uh, you probably want a second set of eyes anyway. I wouldn't do it again. I would just build uh, little sections out of plywood with uh, uh, plywood or L girder girders for stiffeners. You know, I'd use half inch and I would strongly recommend spending a little extra for furniture ply. You can rip furniture ply and it makes great dimensional lumber substitute uh, because the the double slot typically has a, a, is canted at longer angles. Um, the brackets have fixed spacing between them, which aren't quite the same between the different bracket manufacturers uh, or, or standard manufacturers, big pain. So they need a lot of shimming. I would just use two by twos uh, screwed through the wall and then uh, screw plywood brackets to it. I think it's a lot easier in the end to get what you really want in terms of uniform grades. I use blue or pink foam for scenery. Now in the Bay Area, we can only get one inch foam. Two inch foam would have been much easier. You know, I'd been following Bill Darnaby on this and I couldn't figure out why I couldn't get it to work. Finally, I talked to Bill and I found out that he was just angling the whole piece and that worked a lot better. But of course he lives in, you know, Chicago land and two inch foam is a staple. Um, in the end, I decided not to, I, I ripped it out as roadbed. I ended up using cookie cutter, or if I had a little more running room, I'd probably have used spline. Uh, and then I just used the foam for scenery and it's wonderful for scenery. Uh, for lighting, I used 5000K fluorescence. They've mostly been replaced by uh, fluorescent tube replacement LEDs. I like lots of it. I don't know about you guys. I'm old and getting older and I need the light to see, but some people feel it's painful. But my layout is basically, uh, those of your photographers remember the phrase F8 and be there. At ISO 100, uh, cloudy afternoon, uh, set your camera to F8 at a 60th. And that's basically the lighting in the room. So it's bright, you can see. Um, on the other hand, if you like to do fancy lighting effects, dimmable LED tubes are now available. Costs a little bit more, but you have the flexibility. For bench work, I built Westcott's tables. I think you can still get Lynn Westcott's bench workbook. Certainly find it on eBay. Uh, I strongly recommend it. The only thing I would say is, Lynn kind of says, do it with uh, 
a one by two and a one by three. I'd say do it with a one by three and a one by four, not for strength or rigidity, but just because a little extra flange really makes it easier to connect things. And I'd also strongly recommend anchoring peninsulas to the walls. It turns out that the base of my peninsula spanned windows in both cases. So if I'd really been smart, I would have taken a one by eight plate all the way across the window at, at bench work height, uh, screwed it into the studs and secured everything to that. As a result, we had to do a lot of playing. So um, would have been easier to do it the other way. Uh, let's see, used an aluminum backdrop. There are two 50 foot rolls of two foot flashing. No seams, worked well. Only big learning there was use a very, very thin nap roller so it doesn't, uh, you know, you don't get drips because obviously uh, aluminum flashing is not absorbent. Uh, if you live in the aluminum siding part of the world, you can probably get it in a light blue color that's a pretty good sky base. You'll probably need to touch it up a little bit, but uh, uh, you could get um, white and white here. So uh, that's what we used. Um, we put the fascia up fairly early, quarter inch hardboard with uh, about an inch and a half lip of one eighth at the very bottom because we found that the rough side didn't hold Velcro to hold up the skirts very well. So it turned out when we did that, we made like a little drum and then Bill Sorensen, Bill Sorensen, who you all may know, you know, he's a big drummer. He said, oh yeah, we used to do that to our drums, makes them much stiffer. Uh, so <laughs> interesting, uh, interesting trick. Anyway, uh, let's see. Don't need to support it that often. Every two feet was fine. Um, the fascia is great. You saw our workstations uh, works great. As we started to detail things, uh, we discovered that, you know, just throwing detail everywhere in every scene wasn't so wonderful. It's probably a little bit better to modulate the uh, scene detail and create some scene separation, a little more feeling of distance. So neat little, uh, you know, scenic trick. And that's it. And I'll take a breath. And all right. And I saw you sent me the presentation. So it's all right. I'll put that up with your up on the uh, past presenter page. Yeah, if you would just uh, delete the old slides and PDF it. And I just wanted to make sure in case we had a bandwidth problem, you had, okay. had something to work with. If you want to, if you want to send me a revised one, that, that would work too. I could do that too. Okay. Um, just looking to see if there are questions. We'll just work from the latest up. Back to the Melpitas yard. What was the JPB track? Oh, Joint Powers Board. Okay, so the uh, former Southern Pacific Commute Line, the original San Francisco and San Jose Railway, which uh, you may all know as the Caltrain Commute Line, uh, was sold to, uh, well, long story, but it's called the Joint Powers Board. It's, it's really the uh, uh, San Mateo uh, Transit District, uh, Sam Trans. Okay. Um, and anyway, so it's, because the yard, the, the staging track actually stops about, it begins about six feet behind uh, Smurf at Stone. You know, it's just the joint powers board track. Got it. Um, let's see. Why are you changing from PC to Raspberry Pi? Why am I migrating? Um, well, because I have an old PC that draws about 200 watts. And it mostly sits there and I just leave it on in case I need to work with the railroad. And it struck me as a much better idea to have a Raspberry Pi, which only draws five watts. Yep, yep. Uh, let's see. Um, does the 54 reblock at any, does the 54 reblock at any time on its run? Um, well, that depends on how creative the crew wants to be. Um, I did have one crew that even though they were told to only switch a trailing point felt that uh, they had a, a move that could have been, uh, you know, from one industry on the branch to another. We've since kind of arranged things so that probably wouldn't happen as often. So they felt it was important to go up to Hearst and reblock their train. Now, in reality, it's not all that busy, so they probably could do it, but it's a lot of extra work and it, the operating plan contemplating them dragging the uh, uh, empty hopper back to Milpitas and dealing with it tomorrow. Um, 
So if you operate them in more or less standard order, um, you shouldn't need to, but, you know, cruiser, what was that word? Polymorphously perverse. Uh, All right. Um, how are meats handled? Biggest one wins? Question mark. <laughs> Um, wow. Well, yeah, sometimes we have to be creative because Hearst and Numi are kind of the two places you can have meats. And typically BNSF is uh, non-clearing. So we do two things. Either we uh, take the one short train and run it in the siding and uh, run the long one down the main, biggest one wins. Or if it's really bad, we run the longer train out the Nile sub and cross them over. Now for Oakland originating trains, that's fine because they could go either way in reality. And we would just basically use the entire Nile sub as a siding. Um, and then sometimes um, they have to uh, break themselves up and hide wherever they can. Uh, but usually that's only if people are being, you know, extra creative. Um, how long is the railroad point to point? Oh, it's about 120 feet, two okay. scale miles. All right. Uh, somebody suggests that you need to put some a chalk outline on the sidewalk in front of the winery related to the, uh, the, mob, <laughs> the mob activity. Thanks for Dave. Um, that's very good. I'll have to get some chalks and try that. <laughs> um, and it, anybody have a horse model with just the head, you know? Don't get the legs. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, I was gonna say the Numi plant now is the Tesla plant, right? That's correct. Okay. And I I could have sworn I saw loaded auto racks coming out of there just before the pandemic. So they may be starting to uh they may be starting to uh ship by rail again. Yeah. Uh or they may have just been there's a mixing facility down in Milpitas, which was the former yard that supported the Ford plant. So they may have just been dragging cars back and forth to there. So, um, Did you create the switch list by hand? Did you use software for that? The switch lists are created by an RFID system, which um, I think we wrote up in January 14 model railroader. Okay. Um, but it's, uh, you can get a description of it on the model railroad control system site. So not to do a commercial, but it has. Uh, well, play, throw, in a, throw in a link to your site if you would. So. Yeah, let me do that. Um, and uh, hang on a moment here. Let me just Let's say, and to Rich Layman, cookie cutter plywood is basically cutting curves from big sheets of plywood just to fit whatever you need, as opposed to doing splines where you're laminating a bunch of pieces together. Um, that's most times when people are cutting pieces of plywood out, they're cutting the, the sub road bed um, to go under the cork and under the track or under whatever material you're using on top. So home bed in this case, but yes, yep, exactly. Yep. Um, what's um, the thing? Did you get the home bed from Scott? whatever his name was who used to live out there um let's see yeah it was scotty and then um oh golly what was his name the guy who lived up in redding for a while i yeah. don't know i knew a guy named richard scott. richard uh, yeah scotty grubb yeah he was yep. the guy who got a warehouse in richmond in just this yeah. absolutely awful neighborhood and uh <laughs> did all this wonderful dust handling equipment and just made this beautiful beautiful product yeah. and he would custom make anything and obviously that wasn't much of a business model so no, it didn't last no. long. yeah i lived out i lived in uh san Mate or uh, foster city from about september of 95 through about a year later and then i moved over to hayward to save money which was a dumb idea because the bridge traffic is horrible going across but then you were in hayward Ooh. yeah i know <laughs> it's like right on the outskirts I, it was a decent apartment but it I was trying to save some money and it was just a bad idea. But oh, anyway, oh well. are there any other questions for Seth? Uh, just lots of, uh, do you know if uh, Tom's asking, is there a home bed provider anymore? Um, I think it's gone now, isn't it? Yeah, there was a guy called Cascade Rail Supply and 
I know Bill Sorensen and some of the other Sacramento, uh, Sacramento, uh, Seattle guys were really making an effort to keep them alive, but uh, I don't know yeah. what happened to them. Uh, it's too bad. It's a wonderful product. And yeah. Uh, yeah, I just went with, I went with cork on mine. So it, uh, it works. Okay. So, all right. Well, Seth, thanks again for presenting. We appreciate it. Um, everybody, uh, went a little long, but hey, we had 100 people, so you know that's a good day. Um, and just a plug for something Seth is doing: um, the Bay Area Layout and Design Operations Weekend. Uh, it's going to be a virtual event. It appears um, January thirtieth uh, and thirty-first. Thirty to well, <laughs> thirty to twenty-first in your last email, but thirty to thirty-first of twenty twenty-one. Um, uh, if you go in the uh, the unofficial ry ops dash industrial sig groups.io site, uh, there's a little bit of information about that, um, and I'm sure Seth will be providing me lots of information on this as we get closer to the date. So absolutely. All right, uh, next meeting is two weeks from today. Um, and we have, uh, let me see who's presenting. I don't remember off the top of my head. Um, it's loading up here. Uh, two weeks from today, uh, Lee Nicholas and Dave Hussman are gonna be presenting. Um, so uh, watch your emails, watch the various social media channels for the uh, invitation. And be sure to invite your friends, but tell them to get here early because we filled up this week, yay. Uh, this one will be up on YouTube later today as soon as it converts. I may actually do a little editing with that software that uh, Tom suggested, or uh, not Tom, uh, Dave suggested, um, get rid of the little presentation fumble, but. Anyway, we thank everybody for coming and uh, I'm gonna stop the recording.